Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm your host, Aya Takase. I'm here with our presenters, Keisuke Saito and Tim Brado. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining our webinar series, Beneath the Surface, X-ray analysis of a battery materials and structure. In this webinar series, we will discuss how to leverage X-ray analysis techniques to gain insights into battery performance. Our expert speakers will share the best practices and the real world applications. But before we start, a few housekeeping items. This is going to be an interactive session and I will be posting relevant links in the chat window. And we'll be taking your questions live during the webcast and answering them during the session. So please do not wait until the end to ask. Please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We won't be monitoring the raise the hand function. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar, and we will respond to any unanswered questions directly after the session is complete. If for whatever reason you have a difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you'll be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. Okay, with that said, I will turn it over to Keisuke and Tim. Yep, thank you, Aya. So my name is Keisuke once again, welcome to Rigaku webinar session. So let's get started. So today I'm going to discuss when to use XRD, and also I'm going to address some of the basics of the X-ray diffraction. And then I'm going to discuss a little details about XRD configurations, which includes X-ray source and optics and detectors. So basically, I'd like to discuss with you how to pick the right configuration for your battery research. So then finally, I will discuss sample holders for static and operando measurements. But before starting the presentation, so please let me ask a simple question to all of you. Okay, I'm going to launch polling question so you can see it and vote. So the first question Keisuke has for you is, did you know high XRF or X-ray fluorescence background noise doesn't just increase the background, but hides small peaks? You can choose from, yes, I knew that, or no, I didn't know that, or you might not be sure. The yeah, answers are coming responding. in fast. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for responding. I found 60% uh, of the people already knew it. About 35% know you didn't know it. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to wait for a few more seconds and close the poll in three, two, one. And I'm going to share the results. So it looks like more than a half of you knew this already but yep. about a third of you didn't know and the rest of you are not sure. So I guess you're gonna learn something now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you, yeah. Okay. And also so thanks I'm gonna stop sharing. Yep. Okay. All right, great, thank you. All right, so let's move on. So first, let me discuss about when to use X-ray diffraction for battery research. And also I'm going to discuss some of the basics of the X-ray diffraction. So this looks like a battery. So at least I try to. And uh, so let me distinguish between static measurement and operando measurement. For static measurement, so XRD targets like a cathode, anode, and a separator, and uh, electrolyte, if it is a solid. And what we analyze is qualitative analysis. So which means uh, X-ray diffraction uh, find out the phase, the crystallographic phase. Uh, not the chemical composition. For example, if your sample includes aluminum and oxygen, what X-ray diffraction shows is not aluminum concentration, oxygen concentration, but aluminum oxide crystal phase, like a corundum, for example. So to find out the phase, this application is called qualitative. And quantitative, once you found your sample includes more than two phases, so you can quantify the phases, how many percentage phase A, how many percentage phase B. So this is called quantitative. Lattice parameter refinement and the crystal structure refinement. So those are more advanced application. 
So after refining the structure, so what you can know is the crystal structure itself and also the size of the crystal. The crystallized sites, so this is a little different from the structural refinement, but from the XRD, you can also discuss the size of the crystallites in your sample. For example, nanomaterials, the crystallized size is going to be smaller. Large crystallites has a large, large the grain size or crystallite size. So that can be analyzed by X-ray diffraction too. The separator, uh, typically this is made from polymer-based. If your separator is polymer-based, so what you can do is to analyze the preferred orientation by X-ray diffraction and the crystallinity. So this is the application to figure out how many percentage of the polymer is crystalline or amorphous. As you know, the polymer is made from amorphous and the crystalline part. And the wrong period of structure on the polymer also can be analyzed by X-ray diffraction too. And the electrolyte and the anode materials application-wise, it's about the same as a cathode. What about operando? So operando measurement, I'm going to discuss in the next webinar series. However, uh, typically your sample is going to be prepared in a pouch made from aluminum or coin cell. So you structure the battery in the pouch or coin cell. So then X-ray transmit or reflect through the structure. So then we change the structure changes, like I, I discussed above. For example, lots of parameter changes or structure changes or size changes, depending on the charging and the discharging cycle. So this is called operando. A typical X-ray diffractometer in the lab based have X-ray source, of course. So in this specific configuration, we have X-ray source on the left-hand side. So then X-ray generated by the source is collimated and monochromated, if necessary, by the optics. Your sample is placed in the sample holder and the sample holder is placed on the sample stage. And diffracted beam is recorded by the detector on the right-hand side. So X-ray from the source hits a sample like this and the diffracted beam from your sample is recorded by the detector. And we measure the diffracted beam intensity by this detector on the right-hand side against scattering angle to theta. So this is a typical X-ray XRD diagram. So assuming this is your diffractogram. So this information includes scattering angle to theta horizontal scale and the vertical scale intensity recorded by the detector. So from the peak width, so you can analyze crystallite size. So smaller crystallites shows broader peak. Sharper peak corresponds to larger crystallite size powder sample. And the horizontal information includes crystal structure and lattice parameters of the unit cell. And for polymers, so it's about long period of structure. On the other hand, the intensity includes the crystal structure information but extra the intensity corresponds to the quantity of the phase. So by that way, so you can quantify the phase from the intensity and also crystallinity, amorphous percentage in the polymers. So to analyze the XRD data, first of all, so we need to do peak search. So peak search, so we do profile fitting. The blue profile is calculated profile. The red one is a raw data. And the numbers for each peaks are the number of the peaks found. So once you have done the peak search, so you can compare the peak information, like a two theta and intensity information, to the XRD database. So XRD database, if you purchase the best quality database from the market, so it may include over 1 million entries. And the software compares your diffractogram to the database and pick the right phase information. And in this example, software found lithium cobalt nickel manganese oxide, approximately 111 concentration. So once you found the phase, as you see, the each peak is going to have a three digit of the numbers. So for example, this one is called 003. So those numbers are called Miller indices or HKL indices. So numbers corresponding to uh, the atomic planes uh, which contributed to each diffraction peak. 
So this is one of the frequent questions asked, asked by our users. So can we quantify the chemical composition by actually diffraction? The answer is yes, as long as your sample is crystalline. For example, this is comparing three different databases. This is not real XRD data, but I'm comparing the database information. For different lithium cobalt oxide with the different lithium concentration. So the red one, this database is assuming 100% lithium sites are occupied by lithium ions. The blue one, only 75 the green one, 27%. It looks very similar, but if you highlight the first peak, which is 003 diffraction, as you see, the diffraction peaks are slightly step-by-step -step moving, depending on the lithium concentration. So peak angle changes with the lithium occupancy, and XRD measures element percent through the two theta peak shift information, which is lattice parameter. So means, uh, as long as the lattice parameter changes depending on the chemical composition, so you can analyze the chemical composition through X-ray diffraction experiment. The another application is Rietveld analysis. So Rietveld is a profile fitting to analyze the structure of your crystal. So let me show you another example. So this is the data we took, and then uh, after the peak search, so we found this is a lithium cobalt nickel manganese oxide the same one 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 ratio. So once you found the phase, so you can proceed to Rittfeld analysis. So Rittfeld, the software calculate diffraction pattern based on the crystal structure found by the phase identification. So the blue is a calculated profile, the red is a raw data. And our goal is to fit the calculated profile to the raw data. And once you have done the fitting procedure, so what you get is a crystal structure. For example, lattice parameters. This is the size of the crystal along the A, B, C, right? A along this direction. So this is a crystal structure of the NMC and B and C, right? So this is the size of the crystal. And if necessary, you can optimize atomic coordinate, for example, lithium and manganese, cobalt, nickel, and oxygen atoms. And also you can refine the occupancy factors like we discussed in the previous slide. So those application is called Rietveld analysis. The other application is, for example, for polymers. So you could know the percent crystallinity as I briefly discussed at the beginning. So amorphous crystal shows a very broad diffraction peak. So this peak is specifically called halo peak. So this halo peak, broad peak here, is from the amorphous. The crystalline crystal shows sharper peaks. So in this example, I have one, two, three sharper peaks. And on a polymer sample, so what you see is a mixture between the halo peak and the sharp peaks. Integrated intensity of the X-ray diffraction peaks correspond to the relative weight fraction of the phases. So it means by comparing the integrated intensity of the broad peak, hello peak, and the sharp peaks, so you get the relative weight percentage. In this example, it was about 50 and 50. Another application is the crystallized size and distribution. So this is a profile we get, like, like we have been doing. So the first thing we need to know is a phase, right? So we found zinc oxide in this ex example. So once you know the phase, so you can proceed read field, like we discussed for structure refinement. But once you finish the structure refinement, so you can know crystallized size and the distribution as well. So this profile here is a crystallized size horizontal direction in Angstrom scale versus probability vertical direction. And what we get in this specific example is about averaged 200 Armstrong crystallized size. And the software is going to show you a volume-based and a number-based distribution profile. So let's move on to a real diffractometer settings. So on the powder diffraction system, so we have basically two different measurement geometries available. So one is called refraction geometry, which is on the left-hand side. The other one is called a transmission geometry 
uh, which is on the right hand side. On the refraction geometry, as you see on this movie, so the X-ray source on the left hand side, detected on the right hand side, is moving up and down, and your sample is going to sit in the sample holder in the middle. So this specific sample holder is designed for solid state battery structure. On the other hand, the transmission geometry, the X-ray from the left is going to transmit through the sample. In this case, this sample holder is pouch cell sample holder. And X-ray from the left is transmit through the structure and diffracted beam is recorded by detector on the right hand side. And we normally only scan the detector moving up and down. And each measurement geometry has pros and cons. And refraction geometry, generally speaking, have higher resolution and higher intensity compared to our transmission geometry. While transmission geometry has all the diffraction peak from the, all the structure, anode, cathode, and separators, and uh, even the, from the pouch itself, because X-ray transmit through the structure. And also the beam footprint on the sample surface is smaller compared to refraction beam geometry because X-ray hits the sample perpendicularly. So that's the end of the section number one. And uh, I'd like to take some question if we had any. Tim, did we get some question? Yes, we did. Uh, case of K, um, Michael is asking, <clears throat> excuse me, where in the battery industry workflow is XRD commonly used? R&D, quality control, or failure analysis? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I would say all of the field, so you could utilize X-ray diffraction. Even from the raw materials research, XRD is widely used to investigate what kind of phase is in the raw materials. In the production, R&D and quality control, failure analysis. So the configuration could be different depending on the application or field in the use or operation, but generally speaking, XRD could be used in all of, all of the field. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And then Michael had a second question. Why is crystallite size important for battery materials? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, most of the physical electrical properties of function are related to the crystallized size, right? So that is the reason why the nanoparticle, nanomaterials are kind of uh, was quite popular in the last 10 years, right? And so that's why uh, to know the crystallized size is too important to predict the, the character, I mean, the properties of the electrical or physical, right? The material properties. Okay. And uh, Saravanan has a question um, about volume distribution. Um, what is the physical meaning of volume distribution? So volume distribution means uh, by the volume, right? For example, how many, how many percent of the total volume of the powder has this crystallized size, right? So the number based is how many particle has this, uh, you know, the crystallized size. Okay. And lastly, uh, Sumer had a question. Can you explain more about the solid state battery cell you showed in the image? Okay, sure. Definitely. Uh, let me go back. Uh, oh, no, sorry. This one. Yep, on the left-hand side, the solid state. Yep. So you can open the lid and you can structure the batteries, right? For example, the collectors, I mean, the current collector, anode, and the solid state electrolyte, and the cathode, and another current collector on top. So then, so you can close the lid and you can pressurize between the structure to make sure the physical contact is achieved. And then uh, you can eliminate the X-ray from the X-ray window on top. So that's, uh, I mean, the pressurization is a difference compared to liquid-based as uh, a battery cell. Very good. Thank you. That's all the questions we have for now. All right, thank you very much. So let's move on. So the second uh, section I'd like to discuss about the X-ray source, as I mentioned on the agenda part. So from this slide, so I'm going to discuss a lot of details about the XRD configurations. The purpose is to find out the best configuration for your applications. X-ray source is made from anode. So electron beam hits anode target and the anode excites the X-ray. 
a different element like a cobalt and copper and molybdenum in this example provides a different energy of the X-rays. And cobalt, copper, mori, so those are the typical anode materials for battery applications. And uh, from this slide, I'm going to compare those three different uh, wavelength or energy of the X-rays for battery materials. So first of all, the cobalt. So cobalt X-ray source provides 1.79 angstrom. This is the wavelength of the X-ray, while copper provides 1.54. The wavelength a little shorter. I try to be accurate when I draw this wave on the right hand side. And the molybdenum provides much shorter, 0.71 angstrom. And as you see here, the wavelength is getting smaller and smaller with the larger Z. So Z is the uh, element numbers. So with the large Z anode materials, so you get shorter wavelength. And of course, energy and wavelength are related with this formula. So shorter wavelength means higher energy of X-ray. So the question here is how the X-ray diffraction intensity is related to the energy of the X-ray on the diffractometer. So I'm going to try to explain as easy as possible, but let me describe the diffraction intensity I HKL in this example is somehow proportional to F square, so large F square and A and L. So F HKL is called a structure factor. A absorption factor, L Rollins factor. So by knowing the F and A and L, so you can predict, you can calculate the diffraction intensity. So first of all, F. So this is cross crystal structure depending parameter and and also element and two theta related parameters too. And the red highlighted parameter elements and two theta, so they are related to, they are depending on the energy of the X-ray. The F square can be calculated by small f, like this equation. I'm not going to detail in this slide, but the small f's are called atomic scattering factors. I calculated the large F square for three different elements, manganese, cobalt, and nickel, because those elements are used in NMC 111, for example, for three different radiations, cobalt, cap, and mori. As you see, for cap and mori, so the intensity, I mean, the F square was about the same, but the mori is about twice larger compared to cap and cobalt. So this means the mole radiation of X-ray provides better intensity compared to cup and cobalt because mole has less absorption and mole shows lower two theta peaks. So those two are the reason why mole source shows a better intensity. What about absorption? This is an element-related parameter. So this schematic drawing is showing how much X-rays are absorbed by three different materials, manganese, cobalt, and nickel for cobalt, copper, molybdenum, molybdenum X-ray sources. The mori transmits the best, assuming the mori is a 100%. The copper transmit uh, 12%, and cobalt transmit only 8%. So means for the manganese, the cobalt and the copper radiations are pretty much absorbed. For cobalt, you see the cobalt radiation transmit much better, eight times better compared to manganese but copper is still absorbed. Mori, the best. For Nico, cobalt and copper now transmit much better compared to manganese, but still the molybdenum is the best. And as we found, the gray highlighted numbers are very, very small compared to the other numbers. So it means the cobalt absorbed by manganese and copper is absorbed by manganese and cobalt. So what if absorption is large? So why do we need to care? So the first of all, the transmittance is compromised. For example, if you're interested in the operando measurement through the pouch, so assuming this is a structure, aluminum pouch, collector also from aluminum, lithium cobalt oxide, this is the cathode. And the cobalt is highlighted by red because if you remember, 
copper X-ray is absorbed by cobalt, right? And the X-ray is going to transmit through the structure. And only the transmitted and diffracted X-rays are recorded by the detector after the sample. So if you calculate the transmitters, the molybdenum transmits the best, which is 35% of the X-rays are going to transmit through the sample. But cobalt transmit even better than the copper, right? Even though the energy of the X-ray is larger for copper compared to cobalt, right? So this means the larger energy of the X-ray doesn't mean transmit better compared to the smaller energy. This is because of the absorption of the cobalt, because copper is absorbed by the cobalt in the lithium cobalt oxide cathode. If X-ray is absorbed by the sample, so there is another effect, which is background. So this example is showing the NMC111 samples XRD data recorded by cobalt X-ray source. So background we are talking about is this area. So it's like a baseline. So this baseline is very high, which is over 30,000 count per second or CPS in this example. The reason for this high background is because the cobalt X-ray has enough energy to kick out the electrons from the K-shell. This is the atomic structure schematic for manganese. Manganese K-shell electrons are kicked out by cobalt X-ray. And these vacancies must be occupied by other electrons from different energy levels, like L or M. And the energy is higher uh, on L compared to K, M compared to L or K. So by tran transitioning from the higher energy shell to the lower energy shell, the rest of the energy is emitted, emitted as an X-ray. So those X-rays are called fluorescence, X-ray fluorescence, XRF. So from the transition between L and K, so this XRF is called K-alpha. From L to K, this is called K-beta. And those energies are very close to the cobalt X-ray itself. So that's why detector cannot distinguish, eliminate. Eventually, so we record those XRF as a background. So what we see as a high background in the diffractogram is majority an XRF excited on your sample. So some of the people tell me, oh, case if the background is the only problem I can suppress by software. That is true, but not enough, right? The biggest problem is not only the high level of the, the background baseline, but the background XRF hides small peak. So this is one of the example. This is NMC111 with lithium niobate coating. As you may know, the lithium niobate coating improves the endurance property of the NMC. So and lithium niobate peak is actually here, but with the conventional Black Brentano. So this is a conventional diffractometer setup. You can find out uh, almost everywhere. Um, right, this is a classic XRD geometry. But as you see, because of the high background, this lithium niobate peak was not clear enough if you compare to the best setup. And the best setup improves the P slash B, so this stands for peak to background ratio, and S slash N, so this stands for signal to noise ratio. And the best setup includes the primary monochromator and high energy resolution detector. So I'm going to discuss those two components later. This peak to background ratio also depends on the energy of the X-rays. For example, the sample is the same, NMC111, I use the same 104 diffraction peak, but measured by different radiations, for example, cobalt and copper and mori. You see the background for cobalt and copper a little higher compared to mori. And if I calculate peak to background ratios for those three data peaks, so copper and cobalt provided about the same 26 plus minus, while molybdenum showed over 100. What about the Lorentz factor, which is related to, to theta? Your sample diffracts X-ray like, like rings. So your sample is sitting here, X-ray from the left, and hits a sample here, and the diffracted beam is going to be like a ring. It shows like a ring. 
So those rings are called the Weyscherer rings. And as you see, the smaller two theta angle has a smaller ring, and the ring size is becoming larger and larger with increasing the two theta angle. And your detector has a fixed size. And this orange detector is going to measure every different device rings. And eventually, so what you see is an integrated intensity over the detector surface, right? Detector size stays the same over the wide two theta, but the wiring is getting bigger. So that's why the ratio between the recorded intensity and the total intensity over the wiring are depending on the two theta, right? So this is a term, correction term uh, called Rowland's factor. So this is a geometric geometrical correction, which is this kind of shape. And Mori source has a lower two theta diffraction peak angle. So that's why it gets more intensity compared to high angle diffraction peak. So eventually, uh, if you multiply F square A and L, so this is what I got. And as you see, Mori shows, I mean, Mori is expected to show more than 20 times more intensity compared to copper and cobalt. And also we learned the copper and the cobalt X-ray sources may excite XRF background noise from your sample. So up to now, uh, so what we found or what we believe is a Moly X-ray source seems to be the best X-ray source, right? For your uh, lithium ion battery samples. But the question is, is this really true, right? So one of the very important parameters to consider in parallel to the diffraction intensity is the sensitivity to the lattice parameters. So this is the same comparison, different lithium concentrated lithium cobalt oxide. In the case of molybdenum X-ray source, every peak separation is about 0 0.1 degree, which is really, really small. So depending on your crystallized size, so this small peak shift might not be observed in your diffractogram. However, with the cobalt and the copper, even though the lithium concentration are the same, so the peaks are moving much larger compared to the shorter wavelength of the moly. So this is the advantage of having the shorter, uh, I mean, the smaller energy of the X-ray or longer wavelength of the X-ray. So let me go back to the X-ray source. A uh, different parameter in terms of the X-ray source is the power. So in the market, generally speaking, so you will be, so you will find out two uh, different X-ray sources. So one is called rotating anode, the other one is called sealed X-ray tube. So the picture on the right hand side, so this is a sealed X-ray tube. On the rotating anode, so you can apply more power compared to sealed X-ray tube. For example, nine kilowatt for copper, moly, silver, 5.4 kilowatt for cobalt, and 2.2 kilowatt for copper, silver for sealed tube, 1.8 kilowatt and 3 kilowatt for moly. So if you have more power on the generator or X-ray source, what is the benefit? So this example is comparing between 9 kilowatt rotating anode and the 3 kilowatt sealed X-ray tube for the lithium cobalt oxide half cell. So we got three times more intensity, higher intensity on the nine kilowatt because we loaded three times more power. Another example, lithium iron phosphate, LFP, half cell. Again, so three times more intensity. So by having the high power X-ray source, so what you can get is quicker measurement because you get more intensity or better quality of the data. So which means more accurate result. So you can expect. So that's the story about the X-ray source. Uh, yeah, let me ask another polling questions. Okay. Let me start the second question. So this is kind of test to see if everybody was paying attention. So the question is, which X-ray source is the best for an NMC sample in a pouch cell? Those are coming in fast. Yep. 
And I think we're seeing a clear winner of this <laughs> polling. I'm going to wait for a few more seconds to give everybody a chance to vote. And I'm going to end the polling in three, two, one, and share the results. All right. So we Thank had you. choices of copper and cobalt or molybdenum or all of the above. And molybdenum seems to be the winner. Yep. For the most of the pouch structure, I would agree with uh, most of you. Uh, Molly uh, should be the best choice, except uh, if you're interested in, you know, uh, the, the closely uh, separated two peaks overlap, if you need more angular resolution, let's say, so the cobalt might be an alternative solution uh, uh, than the Molly radiation. But as I discussed, the transmittance is going to be much smaller for co cobalt. So that's why you may need hyper X-ray source in such a case. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for the uh, uh, responding to the polling questions. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, maybe KCK, before you do, we do have a couple questions. Yeah. So Tim, um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time left. So I'd right. like to take right. only one question for now. All right. Uh, one quick question from Maxuda. You know how we for a copper source we use a nickel K beta filter. Mm -hmm. What is the filter for molybdenum for K beta peaks? Uh molybdenum, uh I can't remember from the top of my head, but uh, it should be two smaller Z number in a periodic table. Yeah, normally one is it or zirconium? Two. Yeah, zirconium, yes. Correct. Right? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, Nobody k beta filter is made from one or two smaller z element in a periodic table. Yep. Thank you for the question. Thank you. All right. For the other questions, I'm going to respond by email uh, after this uh, presentation. But thank you for giving me your questions. So let me discuss optics. Uh, X-ray diffraction has, generally speaking, two different beam configurations available. So the first one is called Black Brentano. But for your battery materials, so we'd like to recommend monochromatic black brentano configuration. And second choice would be focusing monochromatic. So monochromatic is very important in your case. So how do we monochromate? So monochromatization is done by a flat ML mirror. So ML stands for multi-layer. So this is an optic device inserted between the X-ray source on the left and the sample in the middle. So black Brentano, as you see, the X-ray beam is diverging towards the sample. So typically we measure a powder sample, coin cell with the reflection geometry. X-ray source-wise, we have copper or cobalt. Focusing in monochromatic, so we have the same multi-layer mirror, but with a different shape on the surface, which is elliptical. So by that way, so we can focus the beam towards the detector surface for transmission geometry, either for powder, coin cell, or it could be pouch. So radiation-wise, we normally have mori or silver. So why do we need to monochromate? For high-energy X-rays like a mori, so this is the reason. So this is the refraction, powder diffraction pattern on the NMC111 with the focusing monochromatic compared to conventional black brain tunnel without any monochromatization. So red one is just a BB. The blue one is with the focusing monochromatic beam. So the point is actually here, which is pointed out by the arrow. So by the black brain tunnel, with the high energy X-ray, typically you see very asymmetric background. So higher angle side from the peak has generally speaking higher background. So the reason for that is excitation voltage on X-ray source is much higher for the higher energy X-ray. For copper, we typically apply 40 kV. For MODI, we typically apply 60 kV. So why does this matter? So this is the energy spectra from the X-ray source. So horizontal direction, X-ray wavelength, or invert energy, and uh, vertical direction, relative intensity. As you see, so there are two different components 
of the X-rays are emitted from the source. So two sharp peaks in this example, K-alpha, K-beta, so they are called uh, characteristic lines. And the continuous radiation, like orange highlighted, this is called Bremsstrahlung. So this is could mean this means break radiation in German. So this is a continuous wavelength X-ray, and this Bremsstrahlung, sorry, is going to have more intensity, and the shortest wavelength emitted from the source is getting shorter and shorter with larger excitation voltage K. Sorry, the V. So as I mentioned, for Mori and silver, we apply more than 60 kV excitation voltage. So that's why this Bremse Strahlung is going to be higher. So this is observed here. This is a wide range scan without monochromatic beam, just a black print tunnel. Uh, most of the orange highlighted, yeah, so asymmetry of the peak background are coming from Bremse Strahlung. But with a monochromatic focusing beam, so you see the background is very symmetric, the same level, if you compare it before and after the peak. Cup and the cobalt has different reasons to have a mirror. This is a comparison on the NMC111 sample with between the BB. So BB means without any uh, monochromatic monochromator, and uh, uh, the BB monochromatic beam with the flat mirror in between the source and the sample. And you see the background from the BB is much higher compared to the monochromatic beam, and the peak to background ratio was improved by more than a factor of two. The cobalt radiation, the same story, the same sample NMC111, peak to background ratio was improved by more than a factor of two. So, so far, we only discussed XR XRF excitation by Kalpha line, but as you found, X-ray source emit not only K-alpha, but also K-beta and the Bremsstrahlung with the higher energy than the K-alpha radiation. Those high energy X-rays excite another element. So I just summarized in a periodic table, depending on the radiation, the cobalt and the copper. So cobalt radiation the iron, the green elements. So this iron is excited by K-beta and uh, high energy Brems strahlung. While light blue elements like a chromium and manganese, so they are excited by all of them, K-alpha, K-beta, Brems strahlung. For copper radiation, nickel is uniquely excited only by K-beta and Brems strahlung. K-alpha doesn't excite, but cobalt and iron are excited by all of the X-rays. So that's why it is very important to suppress K-beta and the in the incident beam path so that we don't excite the fluorescence background from your sample. So that's the end of the section three. So maybe I can take one question if Tim received some of the question for section number three. Yes, um, Michael asks, it seems absorption is only a problem for transmission. If I am doing NMC pouch cells, shouldn't I just run in reflection mode all the time? Is there an advantage to performing transmission measurements? Yes, so, so for the transmission, the advantage is you can see through the structure. So you collect all the diffraction peaks from anode, cathode, separ separator. But in the reflection geometry, especially when you have uh, the MORI or even smaller energy of X-ray copper cobalt, so we need to carefully think about how much X-ray penetrates into the structure so that you are going to make sure so you will see a diffraction signal uh, from the interested layer, right? So this is the advantage of the transmission. And uh, Interesting. yeah. Interesting. So you could actually be fooled um, in a reflection geometry. You think you're measuring a certain structure a certain layer but you could actually be a little too high or a little too low to actually be hitting the zone you think you're measuring exactly whereas transmission you're going through the whole thing so you capture everything you just have to do the extra work of filtering out all the other stuff that you're not interested in that's true that's true yep well thank you for the question so thank let you. me move on to the detector okay so in the market 
uh, your diffractometer, if your diffractometer was purchased, let's say in the last 20 years or so, so your diffractometer may have one of the detectors in this table. So the first one, I'm just calling uh, ultra high energy resolution to the detector. So the picture is just one of the example from, from Rigaku. And the second detector is called high energy resolution 2D detector. And the last one is called normal energy resolution 1D detector. So the difference between the detector, the first of all, the two theta coverage by the detector are different. For example, ultra high energy resolution detector covers maximum 15 degree, which seems to be quite huge compared to classic detectors. But if you compare to even larger detector, high energy resolution 2D, it covers two times larger area, I mean a two theta range, compared to ultra high energy, which is 30 degree. So it means as long as your interested peak exists in this measurement range, you don't need to scan the detector. You just place a detector, open the shutter, just keep eliminating shot and shot and shot. So by that way, so you can do operando in situ measurement much quicker compared to scanning mode. 1D detector typically has much smaller two theta coverage compared to 2D detector. What about XRF separation capability? So XRF separation capability depends on the energy resolution. In this table, I wrote down delta E over E. 4%, 12, and 20, smaller is better. So ultra high energy resolution 2D detector can suppress most of the fluorescence from your sample. So that's why it can be combined with the standard black print tunnel configuration. High energy resolution 2D detector 12% is nothing bad compared to conventional detectors. But if you compare to ultra high resolution detector, it's gonna be three times broader energy resolution. So that's why we strongly recommend to have monochromatic beam, either black brain tunnel for infraction or focusing for transmission. On normal 1D, the 20% is considered like a broad energy resolution or wide energy resolution for now, but 20 years ago, the 20% was very good. Uh, if you have this kind of detector, uh, definitely I would recommend to have monochromatic beam just to minimize the uh, XRF excitation. The same example, lithium niobate coated NMC powder, right? Lithium niobate peak is here. I didn't describe the detailed configuration, but now, so I can describe the, a little bit more configuration details. So black one was measured by normal energy resolution 1D detector, while the red one was recorded by ultra high energy resolution 2D detector. So it means only by changing the detector energy resolution so you can suppress in the background, you can improve peak to background signal to noise ratio so that you see it's a hidden small peak or peaks. The other application for such a high energy resolution detector is trace. So this example is looking into the trace in the lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide NMC 32121, 311. The red profile has a high background, which was measured by conventional black brain tunnel, but detector was ultra high energy resolution detector, right? So this example is showing not only the detector technology, sometimes not enough to suppress the background enough to see the small hidden peaks. The blue one, the black brain tunnel monochromatic combined with ultra high energy resolution detector. So we found the purple highlighted small peaks so which are corresponding to lithium cobalt oxide. So this is a trace phase in this NMC311. And peak to background ratio was improved by a factor of three by having the monochromatic black print tunnel configuration. Question might be, why does it have to be 2D? So 0D detector, this is a classic detector, didn't have any angular resolution on the detector surface. 1D, only one dimensional along the one uh, along the two theta direction. So this has been good, widely used in the powder diffraction in the last, let's say, 20 years. But 2D became popular last 10 years, especially. So this provides one more axis in terms of the spatial resolution, which is called chi. So by having the pixelated detector like 2D, so what you can see is a diffractogram like as an image, like a powder 
sample shows a part of the dwell rings like this. Large crystallized size sample shows a spotty peaks like this. Texture sample like a polymer separator shows a part of the dwell ring. But more importantly, so the reason why we use 2D detector is because the 2D detector, detector covers larger two theta range compared to 0D or 1D. And generally speaking, the 2D detector has better energy resolution so that the detector can suppress the XRF background from the sample. So this example is showing the temperature dependent XRD, starting from room temperature up to 1500 degrees C. Recorded 2D data on the right top, integrated profile right bottom. So what we see is a phase transformation from cubic phase to monochromatic phase, and finally tetragonal phase above 1200 degrees C. This measurement took totally only 90 minutes, and we repeated 260 measurement, right? And uh, I hope you can imagine 260 repeated measurement typically takes a day, right? So this could be done 90 minutes if you have a large area detector. And this example was an institute, but this large detector also be very beneficial for the operando measurement because of the same reason. So then let me uh, ask you the final polling question. Okay, so I'm gonna launch the third and final polling question for the audience. So the question is, what is the most important component to achieve the largest peak to background ratio in the bright green tunnel measurement for an NMC sample? So you have three choices. Choice number one, high energy resolution detector, number two, high power source, and number three, large 2D detector. The answers are coming in and they're kind of evenly split, mm -hmm. but uh, now I think we might have a winner. Yeah, this question was kind of tricky. <laughs> this one is tricky, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was thinking, can we have all of them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That is going to be my answer. If I didn't mention the best, right, the important component. But I guess in reality, the budget is limited. You might yes. have to pick one. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, All so right, thank you very much. you answered. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. Mm -hmm. All right, thank so you, everybody. 58% yeah. high energy resolution detector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say that's true. Uh, because I ask specifically the most important component. But like I mentioned, eventually, if you have three of them, so this is ideal, the best scenario, right? But thank you for cooperation. All right, so uh, I know everybody's busy. So let me uh, move on to the final section, which is sample holders. So sample holders, I'm not going to discuss conventional sample holders for powder X-ray diffraction, but I, I know some of your materials could be very unstable under the air ambient environment. In this case, you may want to have one of the airtight sample holders like this example. So the idea is to seal your sample environment and by preparing the sample in the glove box. And once you prepare, you can take it out from the glove box and put it to the diffractometer and you can keep the environment maximum 48 hours. So this example is showing the solid state electrolyte, uh, lithium phosphate sulfate. So we confirmed the structure was stable over two days. So operando, I'm going to discuss in the next webinar series in November. So please come back to the next session too. I'm going to discuss more details in the, in the next webinar, but uh, in the market, so you may be able to find out different designs of the operando sample holders for refraction geometry on the left-hand side, transmission geometry on the right-hand side, either coin cell or battery cell, or some people call it like an electrochemical cell for the liquid-based battery or solid state battery. And for transmission coin cell with the dedicated design for the transmission or pouch, and the pouch with the XY mapping. Now you can see the spatial distribution over the pouch if you have an XY stage combined pouch sample holder. Radiation-wise, so we do have cobalt copper mainly for refraction, could be more silver too, 
for transmission, as we discussed, it should be Mori or Silva for transmission. All right, so let me conclude my story uh, for today. So for the static measurement, so we found the best possible configuration would be copper cobalt X-ray source combined with the black Brentano monochromatic beam, also combined with ultra high energy resolution detector. For Pirando measurement, so we found Molly would be the best choice combined with the focusing monochromatic beam for better transmittance, combined with as large 2D detector as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for one or two questions, Tim. Okay. Uh, KCK, uh, Michael had another question. Uh, is there a resolution difference between Bragg Brentano and transmission with and without the incident mirror? Uh, with and without the incident mirror. A good, very good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the primary incident mirror doesn't improve resolution, but it decreases the background. So it depends on the definition of the resolution, but if you're talking about, I mean, if your resolution could be improved by reducing the background, my answer would be yes. But generally speaking, the primary mirror doesn't improve, I mean, doesn't make peaks sharper. Is there a difference between transmission and reflection? Transmission reflection, um, uh, yes. So I forgot to answer to that question. Uh, yeah, so transmission gen, Measurement geometry generally have poorer resolution compared to Black Brentano reflection. Black Brentano uh, was invented a uh, long time ago, I would say more than 65 years ago, but still the BB provides the best resolution. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe I can take there one is, more. Yes, there is one more. Mm -hmm. um, again, Michael is asking, do I need to change the detector and source when I change the way I am collecting data? In other words, transmission versus reflection. Uh, normally not. So if you have uh, two choices, ultra high, smaller area detector and medium resolution, energy resolution, bigger detector, and if you have those two options on your diffractometer, you may want to switch depending on the application. For example, Operando, you may want to have a larger detector, right? For the normal phase ID quantification, you may have higher energy resolution detector. But normally, you know, detector is kind of expensive option. People don't have two options. And in such a case, no, you don't need to exchange a detector depending on the application. All right. That's all the questions we have. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. So this series you know, will continue. And the next one is going to be on November 15th, Wednesday, again, at 1 p.m. Central. It's going to be about how to run in operando X-ray experiments. I put the link uh, to the registration page in the chat. So I hope you will take a look at it and we'll see you there again. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you next time.